Well, while op-ed pages of major newspapers have been flooded with opinion essays about why Joe Biden should not run for re-election today, the Houston Chronicle endorsed Joe Biden. Under the leadership of the oldest and arguably the most experienced president in American history, the team in the White House for the past three years has performed remarkably well, despite the rancor and divisiveness that have afflicted this nation for nearly a decade. The accomplishments of an administration dedicated to governing, one that believes in the power of government to make life better for the American people, is a key reason we heartily endorse the re-election of President Joe Biden. The other reason, equally important, is to fend off the chaos, corruption, and danger to the nation that would accompany the return of Donald Trump to the White House. The Houston Chronicle editorial offered a sampling of President Biden's accomplishments. Quote, one of the clear advantages of a president as experienced as Biden is wisdom. In this case, the wisdom to get the heck out of the Fed's way as it masterfully applied the brakes to what could have been runaway inflation. The economy has recovered from the perils of the pandemic and is now healthier than that of any other advanced nation, with unemployment approaching a 50-year low. Inflation is trending downward somehow, despite all the dire prophecies of economists without the bitter medicine of a recession or a period of high unemployment. Gas prices have fallen as the U.S. produces more oil than any country in history, including Saudi Arabia. The administration is investing $7 billion in an ambitious solar power project and is promoting other alternative energy products. The Biden administration in its first year managed to pass a bipartisan infrastructure investment and jobs act that's expected to add an estimated 1.5 million jobs per year for the next 10 years. The Houston Chronicle pointed out that the Biden infrastructure bill targets projects in employment distressed counties around the country. One of the distressed areas to benefit is Wilbarger County, Texas. It's worth noting that Wilbarger County in 2020 cast 21 percent of its votes for Biden, nearly 78 percent for Trump. It is impossible to imagine Donald Trump doing anything to benefit any area of the country that did not vote for him. The Houston Chronicle's endorsement of Joe Biden also lists these Biden accomplishments. The Affordable Care Act during this administration has made coverage more affordable and more accessible for millions of Americans. The Biden White House also has given Medicare the power to directly negotiate with Big Pharma, thereby lowering drug prices. After decades of thoughts and prayers and little else in response to mass killings, the Biden White House managed to shepherd a bipartisan Safer Communities Act through a balky Congress. And the Houston Chronicle's endorsement of President Biden's re-election ends this way. We are all well aware of Biden's age, 81, and Trump's, 77, as well as memory lapses that have prompted near panic among many of the president's fellow Democrats. Those of us who remember the energetic, garrulous, occasionally even eloquent Joe Biden of years past can see the difference a few years have made, even if he was always prone to gaffes. Accounts other than the report of special counsel Robert Hur, suggests, however, that Biden remains focused, engaged, and in command on the vital issues that occupy a president. Experience counts. Like Ronald Reagan, Lyndon Johnson, and Franklin Roosevelt, Biden's deft management of his team has made him arguably the most productive president since LBJ in the early months of his administration. He has, as they say, forgotten more than his presumed Republican rival will ever know. That's not saying much, and at the same time, it says it all. Did you see the picture of me, the horrible picture with the stomach out to here? That was... <laughs> so what I do is I'm putting up today a picture of me actually, what I actually look like, hitting a ball, smashing the frickin' ball. <laughs> and you'll see quite... 
I wouldn't say slim. I wouldn't say slim, but not bad. But the ball does go far. I would say it goes about nine times further than Biden can hit it. Yeah, he's fine. He's just fine. And he's running for president. Meanwhile, in the campaign for the Republican presidential nomination, the front runner is campaigning on creating, presumably through a constitutional amendment, absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for presidents of the United States and former presidents of the United States. And his opponent in the Republican primary campaign is campaigning on pardoning the front runner. If you're talking about pardoning Trump, it's not a matter of innocence or guilt at that point, because that means he would have already been found guilty. I believe in the best interest of bringing the country together, I would pardon Donald Trump, because I think it's important for the country to move on. Nikki Haley is saying that she would allow Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's two criminal cases against Donald Trump to proceed to a verdict, and only then would she pardon Donald Trump. But there is nothing any president would be able to do to relieve Donald Trump of the burdens he might face if he's found guilty of election crimes in Georgia. And there's nothing any president would be able to do to help Donald Trump in the first criminal case ever filed against him, which will be the first criminal trial that Donald Trump faces, now scheduled to begin in Manhattan on Monday, March 25th. In that trial, Donald Trump is accused of business fraud to cover his hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels so that he could be elected president. And there is nothing any president can do, including Donald Trump, were he to become president again, to help Donald Trump deal with the now more than half a billion dollars Donald Trump owes in civil judgments against him after losing four civil trials in a row in Manhattan. Our first guest tonight, Andrew Weissman, wrote, if Trump posts a bond for the huge New York judgments via a third party, say the likes of a Musk or a foreign country person, that would be of enormous import to how he would behave as president. Bloomberg News reports on how Donald Trump's legal battles are costing his presidential campaign. Trump spent $51.2 million in 2023 on legal expenses and can tap another $23.5 million, most of it stashed in an allied super political action committee that he can use to pay his lawyers. But as his four criminal cases ramp up, those funds are expected to run out at a critical time around July when the Republican National Convention triggers the official start to the general election campaign. Trump's legal bills have been a drag on what has otherwise been a strong fundraising operation. His campaign and the allied groups last year collectively spent $13.6 million dollars more than they raised, thanks to a large nest egg of donations to save America from 2021 and 2022 before he was actively campaigning. That fundraising buffer has nearly been depleted. And, Senator, you just heard from the Republican candidate who's endorsed by Donald Trump uh, and hopes to be on that ticket uh, running against you in November. Uh, I'm not sure he knows that the president of the United States is Catholic, but uh, what, what is your response uh, to what you just heard? I, I watched the debate. I'm now in Connie Schultz in some study where I do this from in our home in Cleveland, my wife's study, and she knows Lawrence. So I watched downstairs. I watched the debate. It was I mean, that was one part of it that was a little peculiar, but I watched three rich guys, three millionaires who have spent already combined more than $25 million to, shall we say, win the Senate seat. Uh, no mention of the cost of prescription drugs, no mention of manufacturing jobs, no mention of the dignity of work, uh, no mention of pensions or veterans, no mention really of how to secure the border uh, while the House of Representatives adjourned when we passed with 70 votes um, support for Ukraine and Israel, all of those things. So um, it was a sort of vapid debate that they made uh, back and forth. The one substantive thing that they did say is that they all stand with uh, 
national abortion ban, even though Ohio voters, as though, as I've said on this show, and we did an interview back then, Lawrence, Ohio voters by 13 points said they want reproductive rights uh, for Ohio. And so um, the debate didn't surprise me, but didn't really deal with issues that affect Ohioans every day. Well, you're going to be facing one of them uh, in November. Uh, and, and again, let, let's listen to more from the, the already Trump endorsed uh, candidate, uh, Bernie Moreno. Let's listen to something else he said. We sent an outsider to Washington, D.C. in 2016. Fundamentally changed this country and put us on a path to prosperity. We sent a perpetual career politician to Washington, D.C. in 2021 with Joe Biden. I'm asking you to do the same thing you did in 2016. Vote for the outsider. We have enough career politicians that all they want is a job. Senator, what's your response to that? Well, I... I... I don't even know quite how to answer that. Ultimately, what none of these candidates, and I, I don't see much difference among them, none of these candidates really understand that politics is about going around the state, listening to voters, whether it's the, the roundtables I've done, roundtables in 41, I think, counties on the PACT Act. I've been to East Palestine eight times and listened to what do you want government to do to help you keep the to help keep the railroads responsive to accountable for what they do. They're not they came out essentially they all came out against the minimum wage. Um, they're not listening to workers. They're not listening to communities. And to me, it's about that. And then you know we do. And I work with Senator Chester in the PAC Act. I work to save people's pensions. A million, I'm sorry, 100,000 Ohio union members had their pension saved. And I could spend a whole hour on the show telling stories about people that came up to me, including a grandfather in my church. He was a visitor as his grand son was being baptized and he took me beside after church and th I mean these stories are really what what makes this job so great stories about saving pensions stories about the child tax credit stories about they're getting support from the VA because they were exposed to these football field size burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan you know from your time in the finance committee Lawrence and all that all that you did in that committee uh, when you heard those stories about people that got a break in their lives and help them join the middle class, help them stay out of poverty, help them with their Medicare or Medicaid. That's what I live for in this. And that's the stories you get when you travel the state. If you listen first and deliver on on promises, or at least you would, you, you say you will try and then you deliver. And there's, there's no feeling quite like that in public office. What about uh, the people of East Palestine uh, and people in Ohio who have every right now to fear what can happen in a train derailment? What did they hear in tonight's debate about how Republicans will protect them from train derailments like that? Well, they heard nothing. I'm not sure any of them have been to East Palestine. I don't know that. As I said, I've been eight times. I, I do know they kept bragging about deregulation, uh, cutting back on rules, when in fact, uh, the, what happened in East Palestine is sort of this Wall Street business model. Um, you you, um, uh, you uh, lay people off. Uh, you then compromise, then you take stock buybacks and bigger dividends. Uh, executives do very well. You then compromise on public safety or public health and something like East Palestine happens. But all they say is tax cuts for the rich and more and weaker regulations on uh, to support unions or weaker regulations in public health. I mean, look what we did to bring the cost of, of, of insulin down. Look what we did so that seniors keep don't have to pay out of pocket so many thousands of dollars. And um, that's what this job's about. It's not just um, kind of up here that we don't want women to have abortions and we don't want this and we don't want that and we want to serve our corporate friends. And you've had me on this show before and you've always said, how do you win a state like Ohio? You win in Ohio by standing up to Wall Street, holding them accountable, standing up to the railroads, standing up to the drug companies, standing up to the oil companies. And that's why, you know, that's that's why they're trying to beat me. And that's why I know I depend on literally hundreds of thousands of people around the country to, to come to SheridBrown.com and help me because they're going to outspend me. Uh, they always do. But I got a whole lot more people on my side. And that's that's what wins elections like this.
As Rachel reported to you in the last hour, there was another big win for democracy today in Wisconsin. Democratic Governor Tony Evers signed into law new electoral maps that undid Republican gerrymandered maps. The New York Times reports the new maps outline an almost even split between Democratic and Republican-leaning districts. 45 are Democratic-leaning, 46 are Republican-leaning, and 8 are likely to be a toss-up, according to an analysis from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Joining us now is Ben Wickler, chairman of the Democratic Party in Wisconsin and the person this program turns to whenever we hear the word Wisconsin. Uh, ben, as, as Rachel described in the last hour, it only took 13 years. And uh, the what does it mean for the changes in the 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 party shape of the legislature? This is a sea change moment. It is a it's a profound tectonic shift in the basic structure of political power and whether Wisconsin is a democracy. Scholars have called Wisconsin a democracy desert for the last 13 years because there was no possible way that even a huge majority of the public could ever end the Republican majority in the state legislature. And that just ended today with the stroke of Governor Evers' pen. From now on, if the public wants to throw out the people in power, they can and they can put someone else in charge. And that means a new day for democracy is finally dawning in the Badger State. As Rachel showed in the last hour, there was an election where 54 percent of the vote for state legislature went to Democrats, and they ended up with about one third of the seats. That's exactly right. It's it's shocking, shocking math. And beyond that, it means that in Wisconsin, the Republicans in the legislature have only worried about Republican primaries from their right. So they just leapfrog further and further away from what most people want. Most people want to expand Medicaid. They want reproductive freedom. They want workers to be able to organize. They want to legalize marijuana. Republicans don't want to hear any of that. And they never had to pay attention to the actual people of the state. Now, suddenly, all over Wisconsin, there are districts that had been totally rigged before, where people are about to run for office and have a real chance, not just of winning, but of winning and helping build a majority that can write bills. The the uh, the slogan that's that's drawn in the governor's executive office suite is the will of the people shall be the law of the land. That is now possible. It wasn't before, but now it is because people organize year after year to make this happen. Ben, we know there are voters out there who uh, vote for president. Only, it's not even easy to get them to do it, but they eventually do it because they're convinced at the end that it's kind of serious. Uh, and then they think their job is done. They think it's all over. Uh, this took 13 years. This is the kind of lesson of things that happen frequently in politics and government that take more than just one vote in one election. This involved, frankly, millions of people ultimately voting over and over, not just in state legislative races and, and governor's races, but in state Supreme Court races. Huge landslide victories in 2018, 20, 2023, in moments when it seemed like all is lost, people knocking on doors in the middle of the winter in Wisconsin, not giving up. They built this moment. And now we began an election cycle where they can actually use the power that voters have now won. This next year, in dozens of places across Wisconsin, voters will be able to say no more to the extremism and actually win seats, win a legislature. They can get involved at wisdems.org. This is the moment.